Midwest Farm Report series brought to you by NFO, the National Farmers Organization, now documents democracy in action. Action is the commitment of the NFO to the end that America's farm marketing system be modernized. Farmers have a right to price their products, as every thinking person recognizes. How to bring farmers into a broad consensus of agreements act and still maintain democracy within the NFO? The Jeffersonian phrase is from the consent of the governed. During the next half hour, NFO will document this democratic process from scenes from the Minneapolis Convention of the NFO just as 1965 was about to begin. This convention was attended by seven or 8,000 farmers who came from a vast 24 state area and paid their own expenses. Some came and traveled the whole day. Others took twice that long. Many saw, for the first view, Minneapolis at night. The 24 state area is a lot of geography with NFO county organizations stretching almost from coast to coast. Some came by special train as these from Kansas did. Others chartered buses, and still others drove their own automobiles. It was time for making new acquaintances and greeting old friends. If there were no other contribution made by NFO, history would still note this, that farmers were taught to communicate with each other better. What is little understood by town or city people is that the folks who now survive in agriculture are the toughest, the most efficient, and the best managing. And it stands to reason these farmers also communicate better with each other. Only about three and a half million farmers left, but these still produce 100% of America's production. And in the NFO, they know this fact is their power. The first act of a convention delegate is to register, to get hotel rooms, and to learn directions. The business of just being friendly may not look important, but it creates the most potent byproduct of a convention that spirit of cohesiveness. After all, it's easier to break up and scatter a people who have not seen each other. It's another thing when you're dealing with folks who are friends. Even though their homes may be separated by thousands of miles, they will remember to hold together in collective bargain. Each knows that the other knows that the problem is mutually understood. Members of the NFO like to identify themselves. The buttons and badges which sell by the thousands are not merely a measure of the convention delegates' well-known taste for lapel decorations. All year round, NFO people show their pride in letting the public know that they're active in the fight to save the family farm. A woman's view of the farm problem is a view that a deprived family agriculture also means a deprived family. As they rest in the hotel lobby, they talk about the future of the family farm the process of democracy in action begins seriously as the various standing committees meet in rooms off the mezzanine of the famous old Nicolette Hotel in Minneapolis. The Resolutions Committee, chaired by Vic Host of Austin, Minnesota, is in the process of getting the thinking of its members on some questions affecting agriculture. There were several sharply worded resolutions urging that federal market reporting services be overhauled to make sure that the reports don't merely reflect what certain buyer interests want farmers to think is the supply situation. The Resolutions Committee is perhaps the best barometer of the convention's thoughts, because these resolutions will have to be submitted to a vote on the whole floor. Democracy in action begins with an idea pounded out in a committee. Chaired by Vic Holst of Austin, Minnesota, in the Resolutions Committee, he gets a show of hands. And the Bylaws uh, Committee, uh, chaired by Glenn Utley of Indiana, considers ideas for making the NFO's ground rules more suitable to the ever-growing size of the organization. The NFO Constitution and Bylaws are an excellent study in the art of checks and balances to make sure that only farmers can control the policies of this farm organization. A good example of the NFO attitude toward the consent of the governed is the famous two-thirds rule. It's the requirement that such major decisions as the approval of a binding contract with a processor can be consummated only when it is certain two-thirds favor the deal. The NFO bylaws also stipulate that those who hold posts of responsibility 
such as members of bargaining committees make most, or 51%, of their living producing that commodity. A most important aspect of democracy in an organization is how it chooses its officers. How representative is the NFO? The National Board consists of three members, usually from each of those states, where NFO membership has reached a certain level. Other states of perhaps smaller population, smaller membership, have one or two directors on the National Board. These policy-making officers are nominated at state conventions and are confirmed by the National Convention itself. This is a powerful body, the NFO Board. It alone has the authority to call holding actions. It advises and directs the president and other officers, including the great area bargaining committees and the skilled staff people. The National Board meets at least once a month at Corning Isle. Through this board, American farmers are no longer an ineffectual mass incapable of concerted action. The incumbent 1964 board members face the camera. James Merritt of Illinois, Wayne Miller of Indiana, Don Evertson of Kansas, Elmer Schlemme of Iowa, Felix Dieterding of Nebraska, Chris Walker of Kansas, Robert Mankey of Wisconsin, Merle Willard of Illinois, Leo Bueller of Ohio, Oris Canerva of Minnesota, Ed Graff of Wisconsin, John Oster of South Dakota, William Lashmut of Illinois, Lloyd Fairbanks, Organization Director, Missouri, Vice President Fingston of Sergeant Bluff, Iowa, Secretary Harvey Sickles of Fontenelle, Iowa, Chief Negotiator Gordon Schaefer of Missouri, Arnold Wilhoyt of Kentucky, Fred Deerdorf of Missouri, Robert Serber of Missouri, John Cook of Unionville, Michigan, Clarence Dutlinger of Indiana, Ray Hackler of Missouri, Clarence Ewert of Minnesota, Roland Waters of Wisconsin, Gwen Utley of Indiana, Kenneth Stofferin of South Dakota, Al Herman of Ohio, Treasurer Earl Thompson of Blair, Nebraska, Promotion Director Butch Swain of Iowa, Gene Potter of Illinois, and Vic Holst of Austin, Minnesota. A national convention is also a modern administrative office. A little seen part of the workings is the experienced group from the headquarters staff who come to the convention city several days ahead of time and work virtually around the clock to make sure the delegates and the committee people have copies of the many matters under discussion. They also prepare ballots and keep records and tallies and credentials. The first sight of the convention itself as NFO delegates converge on the auditorium from all over the country. The parking lot show quite a collection of state license plates. A newspaper reporter said of these NFO conventions that they rank in size with political party conventions that nominate a candidate for president of the United States. This is an active news story. Newspaper publishers and radio and TV stations send their biggest byline writers and announcers to cover it. They know that this is where the action is. There's a scurrying to get credentials in order and get seated properly with the home delegation. Big decisions are to be made here, and the delegates know it. They're aware of the fact that no state federation screens out dissenters, as happens in some other farm organizations. These men are elected in home counties with full voting power. Seven or 8,000 delegates will need lots of room, and so they file in and find their places so they can act with, or if they choose, independently of their delegations. They have already received full authority from their county. Yes, and women vote, if duly elected, on exactly the same basis as men. Getting their credentials in order. The various states come to this convention. The auditorium looks pretty enormous as it is about to fill up. It will take a pretty big hall to seat this many delegates. Remember, they come from 24 states, practically from coast to coast. There's a visitor's gallery in the balcony, but most who attend are voting delegates. There's a delegation from Idaho. Though they came from a long way, they're proud of how many made the journey. 
perhaps a bit of rivalry with other distant delegations from nearly 3,000 miles, come some from New Jersey, and there is a New York delegation almost from coast to coast. They're proud of their attendance, and the NFO is proud of them. Erhard Fingston, NFO's vice president, acted as chairman because, as 1965 was about to begin, the president of the NFO, Oren Lee Staley of Ray, Missouri, was in the Idle Hospital in Minneapolis recuperating from an appendicitis operation. Reports by department heads and by the chairman of the various standing committees are first order of business. The crowd hears from Lloyd Fairbanks of Missouri, director of the organization department. This is the division which has most to do with the phenomenal growth of the NFO. Bill Lashman of Illinois heads the NFO's meat bargaining division. He gives a report to the NFO delegates. Attention is keen because they recognize the crucial importance of the battle for livestock prices and the power of the packers and the chain stores. Ed Helland of Iowa gives a report on soybean bargaining a complicated business involving nationwide processor combines, area price differences, and a growing export picture. Roland Waters of Wisconsin reports to the Convention on the Marketing of Edible Beans and various aspects of grain bargaining. Gordon Schaefer of Kingsville, Missouri, NFO's chief negotiator, reports on some NFO gains and techniques for meeting with processors and negotiating pressures available to farmers. Dairy bargaining gains also were among the highlights of 1964 as the NFO expanded into the dairy states. Butch Swain, who heads the promotional department, meetings, publicity, public relations. Butch says the only people who don't belong are the people who don't understand it. And so it goes as the delegates crowd around the snack bars and eating places in the convention hall. Others buy more buttons and stickers to help advertise the NFO. And they get set for the afternoon session. As Vice President Fingston bangs the gavel for the afternoon session, one thing is noticed. The tempo is increasing. The feeling you get is that we have in the making a gigantic consensus of American farmers. You find your eyes moving around the hall to spot a number of distant states represented. Just technically, to seat so many people so they can be heard when they speak. It's quite a study in modern communications. Remember, NFO's most important speaker, President Staley, is several miles away in the hospital. How can he address the convention from a hospital room? Actually, that room is a jam-up of television, radio, and recording equipment. Not the usual sick room with bouquets plus a sad patient. Staley smiles and kids back and forth with the cameraman. Mrs. Oren Lee Staley, Ruth Staley. Her husband seems to be on the job for the NFO, sick or well. This is a first for any sort of farm organization to hear their president speaking from flat on his back in a hospital cot. Vice President Fingston introduces President Staley. Thank you, Fink. Uh, certainly, I'm in an unusual position this afternoon. Uh, you know, usually I'm in the position of dodging the darts of the opposition, and I've been dodging the darts uh, of penicillin needles and such over here in the hospital for the last few hours. I hope that I'm able to focus some attention on some of the things that I had in mind to say. <laughs> I hope that we understand that time to pour on the steam. This battle will not be won on the highways of this land. It will not be won on someone else's property. I'll tell you where it'll be won. It'll be won at the lot gate with the use of persuasion and education of the people that are selling. It's a battle between the buyers and the farmers. And the farmers will realize, and the sooner they realize it, that each other is farmer, that each other farmer is his best friend, and that buyer is only a friend as long as he can get the production that he wants at the price he intends to pay. This is the issue. 
Staley returned again and again in his charge to the convention to a theme he doesn't let the farmer forget, that farmers will have to solve their own problems. Staley got a big laugh from the crowd when he referred to a plan of some group to try to buy a chain of grocery stores. Staley said, let them sell the ribbons and we'll solve the farm problem. It was a serious speech, one which dwelt on the weaknesses of the farm price picture. Staley urged farmers to forget past differences and work together to bring their production together into a position of bargaining. We must use a holding action as our main weapon. We may use it in several ways, but let's build between each action to make the holding action more effective in the next action. And let's prepare. And these educational seminars must be the preparation to get more people to understand and realize what we're doing. So there are more people that are willing to say, we've done our job of producing. Now we're going to finish up the job of pricing. Together we're going to win this battle. And God bless you. I'm glad to have visited with you. TV stations carried that dramatic scene on their night newscasts. One person at the auditorium commented, that's Staley, horizontal or perpendicular, he's still the most dynamic leader in agriculture today. As the night session got underway, there was a feeling of enthusiasm and even gaiety. The delegates were there to hear the Honorable Orville Freeman, Secretary of Agriculture. And what they didn't expect was the introduction of two farmers who might be the forerunner of NFO's organization into the Deep South. One was a cattle farmer from Florida who told of a trip that he had made on his own to Georgia to hear some farmers discuss starting up an NFO organization. He made a big hit with the crowd, and his friend also from Florida was introduced. The NFO had penetrated into the South before with accents from Kentucky, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee but this was the deepest thrust so far into the populous southeast coastal region. When the Secretary of Agriculture was introduced to the crowd, the applause was warm and genuine for two reasons. Here was a popular Minnesotan back home, and it was known to the convention that Mr. Freeman thought enough of President Staley that he had visited him in person that afternoon at Idol Hospital. In his address to the NFO, Secretary Freeman spent most of his time as those in the auditorium expected he would, in describing the Johnson administration's farm program accomplishments. He emphasized the increase in farm commodity exports and the beginnings made by the USDA during the Kennedy and Johnson years of ending the farm storage problem. And he dwelt on increased farm income. The night session produced one of the most interesting comparisons in points of view, these delegates who knew Secretary Freeman was to be followed by Vincent Rossiter, president of the Bank of Hardington, Nebraska. Vince Rossiter, advisor to the governor of his state, to the agriculture department, being interviewed by a magazine, U.S. News, he pulls no punches when he asserts that both business and government leaders have made decisions deliberately to shrink agricultural income while the rest of our business economy doubles and triples. Rossiter pointed out that these delegates, he pointed out to them that even in agriculture department releases and news handouts, they've started using the phrase per farm income. Rossiter noted that this is an expression which tries to convey the idea that income is on a par. If you gloss over the fact that fewer farmers got what they got from a total of farm income that did not grow. Rossiter urged that agriculture fight for a bigger pie. The second day of the convention produces what newspaper reporters call hard news. Who was nominated? Who was elected? What resolutions passed? This is also a day of NFO intramural politics. Lynn Bowe of Elk River, Minnesota is campaigning for president. Handbills argue his case. To many outward appearances, this day in the convention is just like the first one. And the vending stands where they sell NFO buttons and badges and stickers are still doing a land office business. 
But inside the convention hall, they're at the serious business, sometimes tedious, of amending the bylaws. This is one of the facts of life about a growing organization. To accommodate new dimensions in size and experience and geography, the ground rules get a going over from the floor. Vice President Fingston, at one point in the second afternoon session, got absolute attention when his name was placed in nomination for president. Mr. Fingston declined and turned his refusal into a second seconding speech for Orrin Lee Staley. As Fingston put it amid great applause, let's don't break up the team. The mood of the delegates was to get on with the business of building the power to bargain. Lynn Bow, who ran against Staley for president, addresses the whole convention. He asserted the wholesomeness of having a choice of candidates and raised some issues which have been debated before at these conventions and will probably be debated again. The relative scope and responsibility of county structures and area bargaining. And for a close-up of the machinery of democracy in action, here are the tellers and the staff people preparing the ballots because the moment for the voting is now close at hand. And in NFO voting procedure, strict attention to the secret ballot is maintained. The actual ballots are brought into the convention hall, and as the voting is about to begin, it is already noted that only those who are accredited to vote have been admitted to the floor. Delegates' identification badges have been scrutinized. When the vote tally is underway and is finally announced, it is apparent to the convention that Orrin Lee Staley of Ray, Missouri has a clear majority over Lynn Bow of Elk River, Minnesota. Again, the art of electronic communications is necessary to get the acceptance speech because Mr. Staley had to hear news of his re-election from the hospital room. In his acceptance speech, Staley urges the NFO to close ranks, expresses his appreciation to the thousands upon thousands of NFO members over a 24-state area who have given so much of their time and energy to build bargaining power. He does not minimize the tasks that lie ahead but urges farmers not to lose sight of their objective. One gets the impression, watching this, that America has, in these times, one of the greatest of its farm leaders in the whole history of agriculture. New members of the National Board are brought forth to the stage to be introduced to the crowd. The business of making introductions of the new directors to the convention goes on. Most of the National Board were re-elected to new terms. As Erhard Fingston had said earlier, let's not break up the team. One gets the feeling, watching all this as the NFO board stands on the stage, that this is more than democracy in action. This is the last great fight for a family-owned land system in America. The last night session of the convention makes a frank play for the attention of the press with well-known speakers. Professor John T. Schlebecker of the Department of History at Iowa State University. Professor Schlebecker demonstrated a school teacher's skill at compiling facts and dates. He described in complete detail and provided some amusing comments in his wry manner about past holding actions of the NFO and the response of the press and of other farm organizations which had had to watch as the NFO kept growing larger and stronger while they had predicted less confidently that the NFO would fade out of the picture. Some corpse, as one observer put it, when the death of the NFO had been predicted by a rival farm organization. Professor Schlebecker has made a specialty of the study of movements and organizations. He has noted that those which have survived are the ones which have a clearly understood and limited objective. Republican Congressman Alvin Okonski of Wisconsin also addressed the convention during that final night session. Alvin Okonski is a gadfly, not only to his fellow Midwesterners, but from the sounding board of Congress in such gatherings as this convention, Mr. Okonski reminds us of the embarrassing facts about how little representation farmers have gotten in the deliberations over tariffs and trade. He reminds his audiences that agriculture is involved, and yet that export-import decisions are mostly made by business corporations outside agriculture. The congressman, an experienced showman, brought down the house with a story he told about a lawyer. He said he reminded the attorney that lawyers name their fee scales and that the Bar Association acts as a common front for attorneys 
So why shouldn't farmers name their price? The last big function of the convention is the adoption of resolutions. In some groups, the resolutions are the most important act of a convention. I'm speaking now of organizations which believe problems can be solved by lobbying. NFO, an action group, has resolutions. They are debated hotly in committee and on the floor, but the delegates know the National Farmers Organization will succeed or fail because of its bargaining actions, not its thoughts and opinions on various questions. The signs are unmistakable now that this is the closing phase of the convention and that the delegates are tired after continuous session for two days and nights. We have tried during this past half hour to document the truth about this movement which has captured more and more of the attention of those who think about the farm problem. This is the movement, this NFO, which first openly used the phrase collective bargaining for farmers. The phrase was a real shocker when the National Farmers Organization first started up and down the country roads selling the idea that farmers should go into the marketplace asking not, what am I going to get? But instead asserting to the processors, we want this price for these products which we own. Yes, the phrase may have been a shocker, but the idea is the authentic hope and aspiration of all farmers throughout our history. And incidentally, the phrase has now become respectable. As one member of the clergy from the state of Nebraska puts it when he addresses farm meetings, attend the NFO meetings in your area. Learn the facts about the NFO, and you'll want to become a member. For more information, Contact the NFO members in your area or write to the headquarters office of the NFO at Corning Isle. That's all the address you need. NFO, Corning Isle. Everyone will belong to the NFO as soon as he understands the facts. It is evidenced in the phenomenal growth of this organization. Some facts about the economic system. Farmers are now producing 40% more than they did as the 1950s began and they are selling the whole total of their production for 15% less. Processors' profits, just in the meat industry alone, shot up 47%, 1964 over 1963. These are times when cattlemen have lost an actual two and a half billion dollars. These are times when beefsteaks in the grocery store cost more, not less. And yet the unusual thing about all this is that you farmers hold the power. Your power is in your production. This farm production was first owned by you. It may not have occurred to many well-meaning farmers who have a wait-and-see attitude toward the NFO that there is no neutral ground. Either your production will be used on the side of farmers in getting a better price, or if you go in alone unattached, your production will be used by the processors on their side to beat the price down. The members of the NFO are calling upon their neighbors, farmers everywhere in America, to join in this all-out fight to solve this farm problem. The time to make yourself effective is now. The time to join the NFO is now. The time to put your production on the side of your neighbors is now. This program was produced by W.W. W. Swain, photographed by David McCullough, with script and narration by Phil Allen. We invite you to tune in next week at this hour for another Midwest Farm Report, brought to you by NFO.